Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Bill Barlow, who's founder of Famous Discoveries, and he's one of the top direct response experts and branding experts, which we'll talk about, with 30 plus years of selling direct to consumers. Bill's methods have generated three over $3 billion in retail sales of consumer products. He's managed numerous high-profile campaigns that include BodyFlex Inch Loss System, which sold $9 million in two years, Kathy Smith AirTag Glider, which sold $12 million in eight months, and the True Sleeper Memory Foam Mattress Topper. I almost gypped you out of $100 million. It's over a billion dollars in sales from startup to 2013, and he took Stains are out cleaning brand from three items earning $265,000 to 24 brand items earning $10 million in three and a half years. And that's just to name a few. And we can cover the whole, you know, we can go for hours just on one of these. Bill, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I always like to start off with a fun fact. Um, and a fun fact about you is in 2012, you went around the world seven times, but none of it was for vacation. That is true. That is true. Um, in 2012, I was specifically overseeing, um, my title at that time was the Global um, Business Development. Uh, I was the Executive Director of Global Business Development for Infusion Brands. And uh, I went to each country to set up the business there and to establish uh, direct response relationships. And in that course, you see a lot of people. So uh, we did a lot of business. We were operating in every continent of the planet. And uh, we were selling products to every country in the world that had a television. So wow. uh, it meant a lot of travel. <laughs> so what was, was the, the, what was the highlight and the low, low light of that? I mean, that's got to be hard on your, your life in general when you do that. Yeah, the low light, I guess, is um, personal. Um, it, it wears you down. It's a lot of, I mean, you don't realize people, oh man, that sounds like so cool, but it's not. I mean, when you've been anywhere twice, you're working, you know, you're, you're, you're working, you know, when, when a, um, a stewardess on an airplane asks you how your dog is and calls your dog by name, you're, you're, you have traveling, a problem. Too, you're traveling too <laughs> much, you know? So, but the highlight is, uh, you know, we, we did some great business that year. Yeah. Uh, we, we made some great relationships. Uh, we, we, we made some world history that year. Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, we, um, uh, a partner and I at the time, um, had a theory on, um, broadcasting. Um, and we actually developed and broadcasted, developed and, and tested a broadcast method that would allow a television studio in one country to broadcast from another country without the people being in the room. And, you know, if you're listening to this, you're thinking, oh, well, that's satellite TV. It's on every, every night in the news. That's true. But what we did was very, very different. We, we created a method where you could control the control room from another country. Hmm. And we did that. Um, I had, <laughs> this is a quick story, but I, I had, um, I had this theory, and uh, a guy by the name of Buddy Winsett uh, was, was my um, technician on this, and he and I came up with this. And we decided um, we wanted a customer to, so we didn't have to travel as much. And I went to, I flew to the UK and went to Ideal World Shopping Channel, and I told them that we had just developed this and we wanted them to be the first. And they said, well, why would we do this? And I said, because it's great. We'll have products. There's people that won't travel. We work with Tony Little, and, and, and he won't travel um, very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's a way to get people. We they can't can get, get some like, high-profile people. A, a, exactly, exactly. So uh, we, we got people we couldn't normally get. And um, um, so they brought their engineer in, and we explained it to him. And, and he said in his professional opinion, it would never work mm -hmm. is what we were describing. Right. So I, so I turned to the board of directors and I said, let me pay for it. And if it works, you will split the cost. And they agreed and we did it. And we broke, we, we broke sales records because it was fresh and new. We made history and they won a ton of retail awards uh, for the network. And uh, so that was our high point of that year. So. so tell me one of those, the high point with the sales, you know, Take me to one of those times and what they're telling you when it, the sales are just going off the charts. 
because of this? Um, um, well, yeah, I guess uh, you have to understand benchmarks. Uh, television mm-hmm. shopping, and this was TV shopping versus infomercial. Mm-hmm. TV shopping measures t- TV uh, sales by what we call dollars per minute. You know, how many dollars did I make in that minute? Right. And all TV shopping channels around the world calculate that way. So we're in Britain, they, they're, they're pounds, pounds per minute. Um, so we had done products, we had selling products on our broadcast that we had sold before at, at a benchmark rate of about 2,500 pounds per minute, which oh. for, their, for them is quite good. Yeah. Um, because we broadcast this to the people at home saying, this is live, this is fresh, this is across the pond, we're doing this, they had a lot of viewers that they didn't normally have. And we were getting five to 7,000 pounds per minute. So wow. because of its freshness and its uniqueness, uh, we, we had more than doubled sales during those airings. How did people know that that was fresh and new? Did they, did they mention it or was it just a different type of product? How was it? No, no. We, we mentioned it. We actually ran promos on the network for a month prior to us going live. Mm-hmm. So we, we, did, um, we did a lot of that uh, promotion in advance so that there was a pent-up you know, kind of excitement for it in the, at the audience side. And then we were teasing them in the last week of what items we were going to bring to them and what value those items were so they could kind of even be thinking about it. So. Yeah. In normal live shopping, you might get the uh, directory and you see it. And you go, okay, I might be wanting that item. Let's see what they got to say about that. But in this case, we had it was so so cool the way we did it. We we flew the host to America and shot in an American studio in our studios at at uh, here in Florida or that what I had at the time, and then we broadcast back to the UK. And the UK was actually controlling the broadcast, mm. talking to our talent, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to talk about some of these campaigns, but I have to ask, you know, the engineer said it wasn't possible. You're right. an entrepreneur. Right. So how did you actually execute on something that they said was impossible? Well, and, and the guy, I, you have to understand, this was a guy who was formerly with the BBC network. So he was a senior engineer with the BBC. So right. he's, he really did know his stuff. Yeah. Um, but we had technology that and new new equipment that wasn't previously available so anybody's experience is going to be their benchmark for their reality mm-hmm. so we were explaining that we had a way to you know package up signals and send them over he'd never seen that before well mm-hmm. that's good for you know good because it never existed before so we we actually created we took two or three pieces of technology that it separately did one thing and we put them together and made them do something new yeah. And and that was our leap of faith. Yeah. And I wanted to go go into the beginnings of this, but before I have a note, I want to ask you, because you're a branding and direct response marketing expert. And right. I want you to talk a little bit about applying the branding to direct response marketing, because I think you have a, a unique take on this. I do, I do. A lot of um direct response uh, professionals, uh, if you ask them today, they'll say, well, we do branding. We, we are a branding company, but very few truly are. Um, and, and the old school guys will say, we're not a branding company. We just use branding and, and they don't like branding because branding in their minds is a, um, is, is expense that's not trackable. Right. And direct response people pride themselves on the science of advertising, yes. the ability to, 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 uh, to meet and measure the goals and expectations of the consumer and then you know, tweak the campaign in real time to it within a reason. Um, but branding is much, much different than that. Branding is the connection with the consumer so that the consumers become your sales force. And uh, you know, if you have a favorite brand, you'll tell people. Right. And you'll tell your friends and you'll tweet it and you'll put it on Facebook and you'll say, hey, I just got my new, my new pen and I love it. Um, and, and that's what we apply. That's what I, when I'm talking about branding. I, I want to move our, our promises about a product, our features and benefits into something that you love so much that you're willing to apply. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what, I, what we, we do very, very well. So when did you see that? really come to form with one of the products that you did where you you in your you pictured okay these are the kind of features this is what the brand's going to be about and then you heard people talking about it or you know it really pushed through on the consumer end um which is your favorite i i saw it um 
many years ago, I was working with uh, HSN. I, I worked for a division of HSN called HSN Direct. And we were very in touch with consumers, uh, meaning, meaning that people love the network. And then they come to the network, and then they'd see what we had to offer. So that first and foremost, they love the network. And they love the host at the network. And then they love the product. So it was the network, the host, and the product. So that they were already branded into loving us or, or, or liking our products. Um, but I wanted to take that and flip it. And, and I, I wanted to take that because I was in the infomercial division. So I was taking all of what makes people really love a product. And I was making sure that we found a way to communicate that and, and demonstrate and prove that to people. Right. So way back 20 years ago, we were, that's when we were taking testimonials and science and marrying the two and saying, you know, we say it does this consumers say it does this, but here's the proof, you know, and then when people then did it, we would re-edit our commercials and we'd say, yeah, everything they, we saw d- did that. So you see that trend a lot more today, but, uh, you know, people that will do a, a, a PX90 commercial, for example, you know, it's the consumers that are doing all the selling mm-hmm. it, it, after a while. And it's not great video. It's video like we're d- doing here, which is, you know, a Skype camera or a home video. Right. Whatever. And that's that. People sell people. That is that is the the bottom line. And advertisers influence, but your friends will tell you something you will listen to, yeah. and that's real branding. Yeah. So, do you get a lot of pushback with other marketers with this concept? I do. I do. Uh, and it's largely a lack of understanding because they uh, they go back to that. I don't want to sell. I don't want to push advertisers. Um, but we certainly can track uh, our branding sales because of the methods that we use. Right. But, you know, I employ direct response. I employ um, print advertising and, and public relations. And even on our public relations, where it's us getting a news article printed somewhere, yeah. I can track that and, and show an ROI. And almost nobody knows how to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's just sort of a, they call it a black science. I mean, we're, we're very, very good at this. And I yeah. think we're, we're on the leading edge of that as well. Yeah. But I want to hear about where this all started. Where are you from? What was it like growing up? What were some of the big influencers for you? Um, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. Um, I decided I wanted to be in television and, uh, you really uh, from early yeah, on, I, really had, I mean, junior high school, middle school, I was, you know, running projectors and, you know, doing, you know, doing geek stuff. And um, then I went to school and um, learned uh, there was a there you have a, a trade school here that's tied to our local college that you, you do your local college course. Then you go out to the trade school and you do, you know, TV stuff. And it was, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in television. And uh, I went there and and um Everybody in class was worried about focus and angle and this and that. And I was worried about, you know, somebody always had to be the writer uh, and figure out what we were going to produce. Right. So I had to, I, I was always the writer. I sat down and figured out what we were going to sell and how we were going to say it. So I think right away in television, I became the guy who wanted to figure out what, how to connect and how to communicate. What was so, it about television? Was someone in your family in television or what, what drew you to that? Nobody. Uh, my dad was a salesman, but the old school salesman. You know, what did he the, sell? He sold uh, refrigeration equipment. Okay. So not sexy. Very <laughs> no, sexy. Not sexy. Not interesting. <laughs> um, but you know, he he uh, he was a salesman. Salesman. You know, he'd go out, he'd get his lunch. Uh, you know, his client to lunch, take an order, and go move on. And uh, that was him. And that's mm. that worked for him. He, he had a nice career of that. Um, I I decided you know somewhere in my youth that if i got on television i could do the same thing to millions of people at the how do you time. know that though i mean what made you think that most kids aren't thinking like that i don't know i have no idea i just it just occurred to me hmm. one day and i did it interesting so what did the early days of your career look like you're in tv you can go a million different routes in tv yeah um i worked for a small agency called Mathry Communications, uh, and, and the agency did uh, local television, local commercials, you know, normal, basic advertising. That was my, my thing. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, a guy walked in the door of our agency one day, and he had uh, a product, and he wanted to sell this product. And, and his product was the Bible on tape. 
and uh, mm. he he said we're gonna we're gonna sell these and we're gonna do really well. And um, the the guy that ran the agency put me on it because I was like the number two guy, you know. So I wasn't the you know we're gonna save the good guy for the real accounts, and he's gonna put me on this thing, you know. So. Um, we hired a producer. We we did, we did this commercial for the Bible on tape. Alex, you know, with Alexander Scorby as the narrator, and we sold them by the truckloads. Wow. And we, one thing we did different is we put a phone number on the commercial, which in those days nobody didn't call. <laughs> you just went to somebody's address, or or it was a brand ad, and we we it was direct response in its early early days, and we put a phone number on, and people could buy, and we sold thousands, and then we sold hundreds of thousands, and then we sold a million, and wow. that was uh, a very very big win, and we sold a lot of those things, and then other people saw what we were doing, and then we started becoming popular for direct response that yeah. became the birth of direct response in our in our definition today so who else came to you after the the bible tapes what other uh, products were you getting that were exciting we had a uh i forget the name of it. i think it was the super wrench and it was one wrench that fits many things that was uh it was a very popular wrench and we did uh it was called the super wrench 1995 you get one wrench it replaces five you know and we um sold those and then the guy that uh, that was the client on that um d decided that he w didn't have anything special about the super wrench that somebody else was going to come along and do a super another super wrench right. and then maybe they'd come out for 1495 and then he'd right. be in trouble so he hires us to do another commercial for another wrench that he was all it was the same wrench the same super wrench we just put a different name on it and we had ran another commercial so he wanted them to think the marketplace was crowded so we that's we smart did, actually we did two of those yeah so how did how did the other one do was it the same or different it did okay but it kept everybody from competing so yeah. uh there was i think we we had three commercials running at one time by the end wow so, so. what was another but was another big milestone so after that stint what did you do next? Um, after that, um, I, I went to um, I went to HSN and uh, I worked at HSN. Um, you know, take my my direct response sort of mentality, and I went to HSN and and they hired me in the uh, in infomercial division, which was the uh, HSN Direct. Mm -hmm. And in that space, um, I was hired as a producer. So I was the you know the, the the producer, but then the way the uh, company worked, I became a product expert of every product that we did because they would throw a budget at me and throw a um, a, a project and say, okay, go go take this body flex show and now let's figure out the show, get it right, and and we'll sell it. And then I had to you know I became the resident expert on the product, and then we would we had uh, international. Ties. So then, all the international distributors wanted to know how to how do I change this or what's important, what's not important. So I, I had to adapt all the shows for the international market. So that's really where I got my foothold set in the international space. So what were the biggest things you learned from working at HSN? Um, I, I learned a few things. Um, there, HSN at that time was in the in the business of opening up around the world. So we we opened up the UK, HSN UK, and HSN Spain and Italy and Tokyo. And there was a team of five of us who got sent to all the new the startup companies to teach them how to sell. You know, mm. and you know, there was a logistics person and a and a operations person. And I was the sales, you know, how to sell on TV guy. Yeah, and. Um, it was really interesting because when we got to the UK, we found out that what we cared about in the US, the British audience didn't care the same way. Like what? So, what was um, different? Well, they're, they're set, the Brits are very good people and they're very literal. Uh, so what we, we use a lot of things we call puffery. You know, we say, yeah, you're going to love it because it makes you feel good. And the Brits would say, well, how exactly does it make you feel good? You know, so it be really we had specific. To, we had to we had to not only be specific, but then they would go and how can you prove that? Mm. So if, tough if you, audience, right? It's a tough audience, but I'll tell you that um, the UK is a very consumer centric country, and consumers trust what's on television because things work very very differently there. Um, 
flash forward to uh, 2011, I went to work, uh, 2012, I went to work for Pitch TV in the UK. I, I ran the channel over there. And um, so I, I had a, you know, I take my international experience and sort of a management experience and, and, and bring that to a new level. But we, we, um, we took a lot of a lot of what we what I had learned learned over the years and then and built on that. But um, what we what we had to do is before a commercial airs in the UK, unlike in America, you have to submit it to the government hmm. and they have to approve that commercial. So imagine, you know, anybody who, who's in direct response is watching this. Imagine having to take a commercial, hand it to the government and say, here it is. And then the first thing you get back is, well, how can you say that? Where's your documentation? How can you prove that? Right. So all that happens in the UK before a commercial hits the airwaves, which makes the consumers very trusting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, you have a much, much better audience if you can prove it. And, and that's, again, you know, getting back to my branding for a second. You, you take that experience and then what I know about customers and the customer behavior and you, you start to prove things to people on the beginning, then you got real good brand advocates right out of the gate. Yeah. So, so you know, Bill, you're the go-to person to go to these places and teach them how do you sell on TV, which obviously translates to video or written word or whatever. So what do you, what do you do? What do you tell them? Uh, well, um, first of all, uh, I, I take 20 now years of experience with international space, and mm. I, I've learned a little bit about a lot of cultures. So I know that if I'm in the UK, I'm going to say one thing. If I'm in, in the um, uh, Germany or, or Asia, I'm going to say something else. And, and that's not to say that I'm going to lie to one country and tell the truth in another. It's just I'm going to focus. I'm going right. to shift my focus of different things. I'll give you a really good example. Yeah. So we, we sold Stains Are Out, the uh, cleaning brand you yeah. mentioned on the, on the setup. Um, we went to um, the UK and we told people that it's the best cleaning product. It's going to clean better and, and it's going to get stains that you never you could never get out with anything else. And they said, wow, that's great. And then we said, it's so effective, you're going to save time and you're not going to clean as much because of all that. And they said, well, it's wonderful. Then we went to Italy. And we sold it there. And we told the Italian women, you're going to save time. And you're not going to have to clean as often. And we insulted them. Hmm. They said, we, we, we're still going to clean for four hours. We're just not going to clean that for four hours. Interesting. So they told us loud and clear that they wanted our product because it was effective. But they didn't want to save time. Yeah, yeah. So what about the U.S.? What have you found works with the U.S. market for selling in general? Um. The U.S. market has changed a lot over the years. You used to be you could sell somebody by giving them, you know, giving them a wonderful demonstration, and you can get away with that. But the U.S. market today is very, very jaded. Um, how many of us have bought something we wish we hadn't bought, or or thought, "Wow, that looked better on TV"? And they, people just believe that TV has got an edge over reality. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can convince somebody through telling through through a combination of the of, of the testimonials of, of third parties and of science and you can you can back that up with social media you've got a winner here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because social media is ultimately what people respond to even though it's not as trackable as others would like it is the largest influencer of credibility just because peers are saying they like it and people will trust their peers correct i yeah. mean you you go to Amazon or any number of uh, online sites, and uh, yeah. many of us will look at the reviews. For sure, and we'll read that when we're making a serious consideration. Yeah, and and if you're looking at a two hundred dollar product or a hundred dollar product, I mean, you're going to take a moment and and hopefully and and see what others have to say. Mm -hmm. And um, so marketing for me today is eliminating the products from my um, world that don't deliver their promise. I, I have a I have a sort of a, a business rule that every product I sell must deliver its promise to a consumer, mm -hmm. whatever that promise is. Mm -hmm. And in marketing, we know if that promise isn't good, don't bother. So you have to have a great product that delivers a great promise. And if you can do that, you can sell it. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the successful campaigns, products, why they were effective, and then some of the ones that, that didn't do well, because we never hear about the ones that, that don't do well. 
let's start with the successful ones. I listed a couple, um, you know, the body flex inch loss system sold $9 million in two years. What were some of the components that made that so effective? Bodyflex is a very interesting um, product because it was based on yoga principles and it it was a deep breathing um, thing. There was really good science behind it um, and people did lose the weight. Um, what was interesting about Bodyflex is we never ever demonstrated the product ever in the show and that's hmm. very unusual because it, it was on it, TV. It was on television. Yeah. Thirty minute information. So what'd you we do? <laughs> never demonstrated the product in use. Um, we showed testimonials. We showed here is someone here is someone heavy. Here is someone thinner. You know, <laughs> we, we, you know. But be, because of the what you had to do, right. nobody would have bought it from television because if they saw the exercise that you had to do, it just looks this, weird or what? You had to take in a giant breath, hold it, and then breathe as hard as you could and it was it was almost laughable uh, i have I seen youtube videos actually like that yeah i know exactly what you're talking about it looks cra somewhat crazy yeah Comedy central actually parodied it and uh it and they and what was odd is they were using people that had actually bought the product uh, uh, in that and if you had seen this you'd never buy it but it works so um hmm. You know, <laughs> so what else worked with that campaign? Because obviously, you know, that's a short amount of time to, for that amount of sales. Um, we had a little history uh, on HSN. So what we what we learned at HSN is we we would take a product through the home shopping experience and vet it there first, meaning that we would all good people in marketing and direct response know how to sell a product. But nobody in direct response knows exactly what to say, what was going to resonate mm. until they test. Yeah. And anybody who's telling you that they'll that they have winners every time is is not telling you the truth. Right. So, you know, we all have to test to find out what works. Yeah. So what we did on you know learned on HSN when I was with HSN and I've been using as, as often as I can since, is we go on a live shopping environment, sell a product, and then. We talk to the consumers and we, we open the phone lines and we ask for questions. And yeah. what we're not saying, they'll ask. And what we mm. then we, our second show is better and our third show is better. Yeah. Pretty soon we know exactly what sells a product. Yeah. And we know what people need to hear and what we need to say and in what order. So what pe what were people asking that you had to start including? You remember? Um, well, yeah, they, they want to know. You know, people want to they they want something that's easy uh they want something that's effective they want something that's uh manageable so you know with body flex uh you didn't need a piece of equipment you you could um you could do it in you know five or ten minutes a day you know it's good it was in that dream product category right um but they want to know you know is it hurt does it you know does it hurt well you know do i have to do you know eat special things and you know all this kind of right. stuff and, right Reality is if you get somebody in the mindset of exercising, they're going to change their habits, which are going to change their weight if mm -hmm. they're se if they're serious. So. Yeah. So you start including that verbiage in the actual show, like it only takes this amount of time, and you start including those answers in the actual show? Right, right. Yeah. So instead of waiting for someone to ask, you start anticipating nice. it and delivering. Yeah. So what about the Kathy Smith AirTech Glider? What is that, first of all? And it sold $12 million in eight months. <laughs> well, there's another product that you, w everybody watching here will know Go ahead. is, is uh, the Tony Little Gazelle. Yeah, yeah. It's the same kind of product as a gazelle. You get up and you move your arms and, yeah. and move your legs and, and that's what a, a glider is. Or they call the, that whole category of gliders. When yeah. we launched that product, Tony had not launched the gazelle at that time. And we um, were up against four or five competitors that did reasonable results and we had Kathy Smith and, and um, uh, she was very well known and she had a, she was great on camera and we had great music and great demonstrations and she just you know did that glider made it look effortless and easy mm -hmm. and it worked and then you know Tony Little came out with his later and really did a lot a lot better job and he you know had a you know, he, he's he's still in that market and we're not. So there you go. <laughs> Tony's a good guy. I work with Tony on some things. So, so why um, do some? Why did some work better than others? Um, like with Kathy Smith and Tony. You said Tony came out a little bit later. And what was you know what was the difference? Because I mean, 
I'm sure the products, I mean, they could be different, but they're not probably vastly different. Well, it's been, there's been enough time on this one, but uh, Kathy Smith product was a good product. But one thing that it it didn't do uh, is it didn't ha- it didn't last a long time. So people who were really using the product were finding that it would certain the ball bearings would wear out. It, it, it broke. Yeah. So we had a manufacturing issue, and uh, what ultimately ended that is we got into a, de- a debate. <laughs> with the manufacturer where we said, guys, you need to fix this. We have to, we have customers, we have a responsibility, we have to make it right. And the manufacturer never did make it right. Mm. And we ended up deciding to get out of that business rather than to sell a product that was inferior. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And it was hard because we had, we knew we had a great product, but because of the relationship we had with the manufacturer and the agreements that were on our plate, we couldn't get into another glider and they wouldn't fix it. Mm. So we, our hands were tied, unfortunately, on that particular. How did you start working with Tony Little? Did he come to you? Did you find him? I started with Tony uh, back at HSN when I worked uh, with HSN Direct. We we did his first infomercial live and did a number of projects with him. And um, even as current as Famous Discoveries, I've worked with Tony on um, some of his food projects. He's got a number of food items on HSN. And uh, we've we've provided him that product, and um, I, I bring him products from time to time. When I f- I see something good, I think it's a good fit for him. I bring it to him and see if he likes it. So. Yeah. So what about the True Sleeper, the True, True Sleeper memory foam? Right. True Sleeper was, is a really interesting story. Um, I was uh, working for Thane at the time, and uh, uh, we. Um, we're seeing the Trimperpedic was doing really great numbers on television. Yeah. And that, that is at that time is a $5,000. It's a whole bed and we, and they ship it to your house. And we, we wanted in that business because we saw it was a great opportunity and we had an opportunity to buy, to buy into that. So they basically put, you know, a bunch of us in the conference room and said, go figure it out. Let's, let's get in that business. Let's find out how we can be the better Trimperpedic. Yeah. So, we were kicking the, you know, doing a brainstorming and we were looking at the bed and thinking, wow, this thing is, you know, so what, I, I'm like, what is it made of? So we got two inches of memory foam. We got this heavy, dense foam and then we got a base. And, you know, after playing with it for a while, we said, you don't need the whole bed. Right. Just, you know, we just sell them the top two inches because that's all of our marketing was that top two inches. You know, right. the, the handprint on the memory the, foam. The wine glass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, that's your sale right there. Right. So. Plus, it solved a lot of issues. We didn't have to deliver a whole bed. We'd have to take away someone's whole bed. We could just roll up yeah. the thing, put it in That's a box, huge. ship yeah. it to a house. It was a big deal. And we were 250 bucks when they were 5000 And we sold the same sales pitch. So we uh, did a really great marketing campaign. Um, everybody came after us, questioned our claims. We survived all of it. We had not one uh, challenge claim that we couldn't substantiate um it was a wonderful wonderful campaign i mean we were all high-fiving each other in the hallways uh, on a that billion one. dollars yeah yeah billion dollar sale well, bill go back because you have you start with this idea so what right. do you do next i mean you still have to produce this high quality product and then sell it there's a there's a large large gap in there well sure uh we we um we had uh, three different suppliers that we r- reviewed and vetted um, and found uh, a supplier who was going to give us the, the, the memory foam that has the right quality, that would give us the right story, that would do all the things that, me- that Tempur-Pedic would do yeah. when you laid it on your mattress. And we, we brought in a ton of samples and played with them and literally brought them to our houses and slept on them and made, mm-hmm. them, made sure we were happy. And then we you know, said, okay, well, now we have that. So what can we say? Let's do some science. Let's test it. We, we do a thing called... Uh, um, a body mapping where you lay this piece down and you lay on it and it'll show you where you're getting um, uh, sensor maps. Oh, yeah, so yeah. It'll show you where you're getting um, help on your neck or your back. And so we did all of that ourselves. And when we were happy with the product, then we, you know, we named it True Sleeper. And uh, I think that was my name. Actually. I like that name. Yeah. 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 I, I'm usually good at names. <laughs> names are one of my things. So usually good at them. So, um, we, we found that you know once we were happy we decided that we we would 
put our name, you know, put a name on it and put the company's uh, resources behind it. We we shot an infomercial with uh, Joe Farrago, and uh, so you know, we like I said, we did very very well um, and sold it all over the world. So was that the main with the infomercial? Was it sold only on infomercial? Were there other things that you were doing to to help with the sales? Um, no, we sold primarily on infomercial. Um, we did sell in live shopping. We we were on QVC uh, in the U.S. We were on QVC UK, um, a number of shopping channels around the globe. But we we sold a lot of um, a lot of our most of our business was was infomercial. Yeah. Um, and then to this day, uh, Oaklawn in Japan sells the product in in um, uh, Asia hmm. because of one little thing. When we were doing the show, you know, I have a thing about uh, DRTV sales. It, People buy because it's not what it does; it's what else it does. You know, people say, "Well, and it also does," right. and that's what, sort of what makes people buy. Yeah. You know, so that's my. I was watching book. one the other day, and that was exactly. I so I'm like, I don't need this, and then three things in. Oh, it also does this. Like, oh, I actually need that. Yes. Right, right, and that's my my theory of direct direct sales is is a direct uh, response is it's not what it does; it's what else it does that trips the customer. Yes. So. You know, we were looking for what else it does. You know, what what else does uh, a a true sleeper top mattress? You got me. Yeah. You know, so we started. Uh, we threw it in the back of a van and said, "Look, you can use it for the kids while they're camping, or you can use it in your RV or your boat." And and I got the wild idea of taking a a futon. You know, those those cheap futon. Yeah bed to couch things and i stuffed one in there and said hey now you take an ugly uh, uncomfortable futon and you make it a comfortable place that anybody can sleep well that you know people here thought that was interesting but in japan where they sell futons as a primary bed they it went on fire wow so uh, literally um to this day they they still sell and it's that pitch that that got their attention so do you sit down and write because I know you're a writer. Did you do you write out the the infomercial? How does that that aspect work? Um, yeah, I, um, I I'm a branding guy, so I and I think like a branding person. So I I before we sit down and write a project, I I may or may not write the whole project. Yeah. But what I will do is I sit down and I run through the branding exercise. What is good about this thing? What is not good about this thing? What do we like? What is good? And we go through this whole, I have a, a I call it my patented process, but I have a, we have this whole process that we go through and it's all your features, all your benefits, all your things you want to communicate, all the, everything about a product. I've got a little, you know, kind of a methodology and I've got it down to a yeah. little science. We do all that first. So we basically, now we have a reservoir of information and then we take that, we flow that into you know, first our shopping pitch or our infomercial or yeah. whatever we're doing and do it that So way. that creates the guts of pretty much what the content's going to be and right. then they polish it up sort of. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of times uh, you, know, you know, need a good slogan. You need, you know, name helps. Uh, but without that, um, you're guessing at a lot of stuff and you're trying to string stuff together that, yeah. you know, it's hard. And if you can figure all that stuff out, you know, what's our science, what's our, you know, what do we want to communicate? What do we what do we think people want to want to tell their friends, and why mm. why would they do that? And all these little things. If you can get all that figured out, the the show or commercial or whatever writes itself almost. Yeah, and then so Bill, you also took the stains are stains are out cleaning brand, right? And exploded that. So what's a good story from the stains are out? That's an interesting Dave. story. Um, Stains Are Out was first launched by my um, uh, old partner, um, Akos Jankira. And he had been selling Stains Are Out in local uh, Canadian uh, home shows and uh, fairs and things like that. And then he got onto QVC and, and he had a little success uh, with it. And, and he knew he had a great product and it was doing, it was doing all right. And, and he was sort of at this glass ceiling stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he came to me and he said, man, I really, I need, I need some help. We, we, I know this is a great product. I know we're going to do well with it. Yeah. Uh, the product really does work. It delivers its promise, all the things you say, but we got to, we got to get it over the line. How do we, yeah. how do we do that? So we became partners, uh, to do just that. And, um, um, one of the things I did is I studied his pitch. I went back and did my branding exercise and, and, and kind of, you know, the anatomy of cleaning, um, 
and, and found out that we were saying too much. Uh, and, and ACOS is a phenomenal uh, demonstrator and presenter. But one of the things he did, he was so compelling on television that you never stopped watching him. So uh, we had to work on his pitch so that he could actually slow down and say, did you see that? Can you take a look at that? Now, what would you do in that situation? We had to actually create moments of lull so people would get on the phone and buy. Ah, I see. Because <laughs> all of his phone calls were coming after the presentation. So we did that, and then we realized that the product was too broad. You know, we said too much about it, so we focused our pitch down to something that was manageable. And we took all of those other products that we were sort of describing and we made them different products different items so we you know we had one for one for pets and one for this kind of stain one for tub and tile and we you know started expanding the line and once we had a customer who bought our product and loved our product and and got results i mean stain cleaners i mean there's a great great example all of us buy stain cleaners and very few of us believe they're going to work I mean, we had testimonial after testimonial after testimonial. People said, wow, it worked. Right. It, it, you know, we bought it's it. It's amazing, right. But we didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> uh, and, and Talk about product, jaded, yeah. <laughs> but people in the cleaning space are because nothing yeah. on TV is quite as it appears. Right. Because um, you have to accelerate, you know, because you can't be scrubbing on a stain for a minute and a half if that's what it takes. Right. So everything on TV, it's instant and magic and effortless and, you know, and, right. and you know, you have to do that because that's all the time you have. But, you know, you also have to be honest in that it will it will work for you, you know, yeah. and if it doesn't work for them, they're not going to buy it. Yeah. And Bill, I was also reading you co-developed and marketed 20 new kitchen and other appliances for Westinghouse brand. Yes. So how do you even just start to co-develop and market these? What was one of your favorites from from the appliance space? Hmm. We had, um, uh, well, a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Jernigan, um, guy been in the, in the direct response space for, a bit, for quite a number of years, um, became the president of, of, of um, the, the division that owned Westinghouse, the, the Westinghouse license for North America. So he worked with a company called SAI, South Asia Incorporated, and their task was to come up with all these new products. So Jim came to me and said, well, Bill, let's do, let's, what would your approach be to, to design new products? Because Westinghouse wants to take the line. It's a 100-year-old brand. We want to be a, a, a current, relevant, modern brand, but have a 100-year-old legacy. So how do we do that? Yeah. And I said, well, let's start by designing what we want to say. And then fig making the product do that. So we, hmm. we went through item by item and said, okay, we have a blender. What would we love this blender to do? What would we want to, how, as marketers, what would we be proud of? How would we be different? You know, so we took each item one at a time, held it up to the competition and said, we could, we could uh, clean their clock if we did this. Or we could be better than them if we did that. Or we could be faster if we did this. And we literally went through each item. And that's how we did it. But so you reverse answer, engineered kind of what you wanted to do and went backwards. Yeah. So we made the designer design team in Asia build the products that we marketed first. And then it, it was great. So my favorite of those, just to answer your question, yeah, yeah. was a, uh, we had a, um, uh, an oven that was a countertop oven that used, uh, it was a vapor oven. So it, it actually used water. Um, so that, you know, when you use a, you do a micro microwave cooking, it dries out your food, it gets rubbery and yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. This was an oven where you actually put put water in hmm. and it kept everything from doing that. So it, it worked faster. It was more efficient, but it, everything was moist and delicious and it didn't get all rubbery. And it opened up a lot of cool things you could do. Because once you put water in, then you can flavor the water. And then things taste uh, like yeah, rose, yeah, yeah. You know, rosemary chicken. Just put a little water, you know, boom. And it's, it's super simple. But, you know, but it was an expensive product. It was, uh, you know, a, about 400 bucks retail. You know, it was hard to, hard to sell that one mm -hmm, on TV. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the ones, those were the successful ones. What were some ones we, no one's heard of because they didn't do well? And, and why do you think? Um, we had, uh, there's been a number of products. I'll, I'll give you an example. Go, I'll go back a little ways, but we did a product with Bruce Jenner 
uh, many years ago. Yeah, I know yeah. he's I know he's in the news now for different reasons, but Bruce is a good guy. Bruce um, Jenner, we had a product that was called the Generator, uh, named after him, okay. and it was a all in one fitness machine, and it did it was it it folded up into something about you know two foot ha- two foot high by you know four three foot wide, but it opened up to be a to replicate every piece of equipment in a gym. And it used a band method, but it, it was really a very interesting device. And for someone who didn't want a gym or even with a home or apartment, they could have a home gym. And it, the pitch was good. The idea was good, but it didn't work because for, for a couple of reasons. It, it was, you know, it was a transformer. You know, you had to move it around. You had to learn how to do it. So you had to have instructions and you had to keep those instructions. You never could lose them or you'd forget how this thing <laughs> changed. So that was complicated. And it was, you know, it was one ninety nine, which isn't cheap for people, and uh, it was it was hard to demonstrate that because we you, you don't have a lot of time to do that, and we you know we did a lot of live shopping and and tried to vet out our pitch and we just you know it was just too complicated. Mm-hmm. So it, you know some things are great ideas that you know. I, I'll give you a quick other one. Yeah, go ahead. You have the time. Yeah, as many as you. Yeah, for sure. We had a guy who was the um, who was a formulator for a a, a, a very very large like Johnson and Johnson level um, company, and he had made a shampoo. He had been making shampoos his whole life, and he got out of that company and said, you know, we. Um, we are doing shampoo all wrong because the hair the head is a, a growing organism, even though it's dead when it comes out. Uh, you need a pro- you need a proper pH on your on your head, and you know, shampoos talk about that, but we don't really know what that means. Right. And uh, um, as as consumers, we don't know what that means. And and when you're having a bad hair day, this is a, as an example, your the pH of your hair is probably off, and it's not behaving well right. you know so that's a, usually a bad hair day means that your ph is off in your hair okay. so we he created a ph perfect um but in order to know what your ph is you had to test your hair so that required just a little tiny snip of hair put it in a little vial test it up and you, you know it turned the wrong it turned one color you you use this shampoo and if it turned another color you use this shampoo but your hair was always perfect and you test it periodically but that little piece of hair, cutting that off, asking a woman with a pretty good hairdo to <laughs> get out her scissors and just like that, not so Not going to happen. No, no. That's, that was a hard sell. So That's a good one. Any other good, uh, good not working campaigns? Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, you know, a lot of fitness items don't work. What about uh, one that you thought was going to do really well? Like this is going to be a huge winner and it just flopped. Well, uh, we had one uh, with Hulk Hogan. Um, it was Hulk Hogan's uh, gym in a bag. It was a, a portable gym. You can go anywhere, do anything. It, it was it was a really cool product. And we thought, okay, we have Hulk Hogan. We have a great product. We have a very good price point. It's easy to use. Five, ten minutes a day. You can't lose. I mean, you got everything you need. And we did a very expensive infomercial. And it bombed. I mean, it bombed. And um, so we went back and we spent more money editing than most people shoot in the first show. Wow. And we did everything we did everything we thought humanly possible you could do, and it just people didn't like it. People didn't Why like do you it. think? Why do you think it didn't work? You know, I don't know. Uh, to this day, you know, it's a mystery. still haunts you. You know. No, I turned Snuggy down twice uh, because I said that'll never work. So uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not always right. <laughs> what about on the opposite end where you're not so sure it could be good and it was just huge success? Um, we've had a few of those too. Yeah, I mean, we had. Um, trying to, yeah, we've had a bunch of those. But I, I had a product called the Power Plank, which was a, was a big success, and probably more out of the U.S. than in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a really cool product. Um, it was, uh, you know, the pitch was East, east meets West. It's the, uh, it's a combination of the plank position and a, and a, and a reverse crunch. And boy, I, I mean, that product has done extremely well outside the U.S. And, and I thought, you know, it, we might get a hit. It might be, you know, six months, but it was a good long hit. 
So I, I think it's still selling actually. Really? Yeah. So Bill, tell me about famous discoveries. What are some of your favorite stories, products, sales from famous discoveries? Um, well, some of those are famous discoveries projects that mm -hmm. I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, we've, we've got a product right now. That's, uh, I guess my, my current love is a product called true sleep or true sleeper, true, uh, true color sunglasses. I think I have one right here. So true color is a, um, is a, a um, sunglasses that are um they the pitch is the the lenses are coated with melanin like as like as in your skin uh -huh, uh -huh. so it keeps um it keeps the glare down or it keeps the glare uh, you know eliminated and um it, it's kind of a long story but many years ago um some friends of mine were doing the commercial and it didn't go so well and i helped um i helped them I consulted on them to, to help them get this, you know, to do a re-edit. And, and this thing did very, very well. They were just, you know, off the mark just a little bit and it did well. And then when it came time to do, you know, to update the show and freshen it up, they said, man, we, you know, we, we really appreciate you helping us way back when we've sold, you know, $26 million of this thing. We'd like to, uh, we're tired. We want you to take over. So they just basically handed me the product and said, run with it. You know, So that's amazing. Yeah, so we, um, but the product needed a lot of updating. So the styles were old. Um, the uh, product needed updating. So I, I went through and redesigned the lens styles and, and did consumer research. What do people really want? And, and we've updated that. And that's just really getting out of the gates uh, as, as a new line right now. But that's, that's a really great line for us. Nice, We're really enjoying nice. that. And Bill is also reading. Famous Discoveries was so popular that Response TV acquired it for six million dollars, and then you reacquired it. Yes, yes. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Um, Response Television bought us um, in two thousand and seven. Um, we were in a, we were growing. Our stains are out business was the, was the primary growth i mean we we had grown that stains are outlined it was like i said it was a couple hundred thousand in sales to we were 10 10 million a year and we could not finance the company growth anymore and we we grow so so fast it's a good problem bank. right well it, it is but a problem um yeah. it but it yeah it was a good problem but you, you can't go to the bank when you grow really fast and say hey guys i need a line of credit um they'll give you a line of credit but it's not enough and if every month you're going back, oh, I need to double my line of credit because my sales are so good. Banks get real nervous real fast and say, uh, you know, I, I tell people there's two things that kill all companies. And that and in this order, it's success and failure. Hmm. Um, success kills more companies than failure. And, and it's because growth or mismanagement of inventory can can and has ruined many a company. Hmm. Um and we managed our business and, and bottom line very, very well, but we still needed money to grow. And so that's why uh, Response, um, Response TV bought us. Um, they just, uh, their management was such that they just, they want, first thing they want to do is change everything. So we, they came in and said, okay, I like how you're doing this. I like that you're making money. We're going to change that. And I'm like this. I like that. We're going to change that. And I said, guys, don't do that. Don't do that. So they, they did it anyway. And, um, uh, the net net was, uh, they, you know, it, <laughs> things didn't go well. So I just got, um, I, we had a clause back that we, we could reacquire or I could reacquire if, you know, they uh, brought it below certain levels and they managed to change enough that it just didn't, uh, didn't go well. Yeah. So I, I got the company back, um, and had it dormant for a little while and because I was on another, in another, uh, venture. And then I, once I got out of that venture, I, I came back and we restarted famous yeah. discoveries and we're off. So, off but what do you do to relax? It seems like you're go, go, go all the time. Like after they sold you sold it, I mean you should have been on a beach in Hawaii or something. And what uh, what do you do to relax? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I, this is probably true of most people in this industry. When you are when you love this industry, you, you're not working. I mean, yeah. I I'm not working. Yeah. I, I haven't worked a day a day in my life. I mean, I I love what I do. 
uh, you know, a nice glass of wine, you know, is the answer to that question yeah. probably. But uh, I don't, I, I love every, I love what I do. So yeah. I, I never, I never have to do yeah. that. So Bill, since it's Inspired Insider, uh, my question is, what's been the lowest moment and how you pushed forward through those tough times? And then on the flip side, what's been one of the proudest moments? Um, my, I think one of my lowest moments was what we were just sort of talking about. I, I don't want to get into details, uh, mm. super details, but when, when you put your heart and soul into a company and you grow it from a $25,000 credit card, you know, and you, you know, you have a dream and you build that up and, and, and in three and a half years, you're making $10 million a year turnover on your company. That's a pretty good time. That's great. You know, so yeah. that's a very proud time for me. Yeah. Uh, and my partner at the time, we were very proud of that. We, we didn't sell our company because we had to, we sold it to, to, so all of our people could stay employed and we could get, um, you know, we could get to the next level right. uh, that, that didn't work out. The lowest moment was, you know, less than a year later when somebody else has my checkbook, my keys to my castle and the control of my, of my old destiny right. and want, they change everything and it starts to reflect in down, 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 down. And, um, to bring, to, to see that happen, you know, is, is, is hard. It's oh, very, yeah. very hard. really hard. And, um, it's like seeing your baby just deteriorate. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, it's very, very difficult, but, um, you know, you have to have, you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have some faith uh, that you're going to do it. If you did it before, you can do it again. Yeah. Um, and you, you have to figure out what you have that you can build on, you know? So once you get to a point where, you know, you have to take a company now who was something and, it, you know, for nothing to right. something back, from, back to nothing, you have to go back to something again. So, um, I ask because mentally, what were you thinking about? Because some people go, they say, if I had to do it all over again, I don't know if I can do it. And in this situation, you almost have to do that. Well, I didn't have to do it all over again. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I did. And yeah. I wanted to. And uh, uh, we have made great strides uh, in this, you know, their famous discovery rebirth. And, you know, we've taken it from, I mean, they, what they gave back to me was uh, of almost zero value. You know, wow. so that that's, you know, that's tough. <laughs> that's hard. Very but, tough, yeah. Um, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wired in such a way that I'm, I'm here to succeed. And yeah. uh, I've taken very little and, and, and made good things. And I believe I can do that. And mm. um, it, it's, it's a matter of focus. You know, you can do 50 things, but you can't do them all right now. Mm -hmm. um, get a focus. Do Start with what you're good at. And build and build and build on that, and don't don't try to be everything and do everything, mm -hmm. but just but just build. So, what's been the proudest? Uh, I guess going back to when we when we just before we sold it, uh, that was pretty a pretty proud time. Again, I started that company originally with a twenty five thousand dollar credit card. That's debt. amazing. Uh, and, and the belief that we could do great things, and we did. Yeah. So. You know, Bill, I really appreciate your time. I want to hear um, one last thing about your book. I want you to mention your book because um, I love the title, Life's a Pitch and Then You Buy. And yes. you talk about some of the principles of the pitch to the core of communication. Right. I'll, I'll give you a quick history. Um, there's an organization called uh, the um, um, uh, ERA, the Electronic Retailers Association. Um 20 some years ago, they had a different name. They were called NEMA, the National Infomercial Marketers Association. And uh, when I was at HSN, um, the, NEMA uh, had, they were trying to develop um, uh, motivational and sales tools and all these things for members, you know, because they were trying to grow the knowledge base and big, you know, grow members and whatnot. So they approached me and said, would you put something together as a sort of a sales and marketing thing that we could put in our bookstore and we can kind of push. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll think of something. So, you know, I kind of went away and I said, well, what do I know? You know, I, I sell things, you know, so, and, and I thought, well, why do I sell things? What, what, what are the principles of that? So that's kind of what I kind of focused on. And uh, I came up with the title, Life's a Pitch and Then They Buy. So I thought, well, 
everything's a pitch. So really what the book, um, what the book covered was all forms of communication, whether it's an infomercial, a, a, a preacher telling a sermon, a, a movie, uh, a piece of art on a wall, everything has one thing in common. You're trying to communicate something. So you have to, if in order to be good at that communication, you have to decide, and this goes back to my branding roots, what is it that I want to say? What do I want them to think? How do I want them to react? What's my outcome? If I can follow that journey in my communication, whatever that communication is, yeah. it will, and how many times have we read something and go, okay, what do I do? And I, you can't find, you know, there's no call to action. There's no button. There's no, right. we read a bad brochure, you know, right. so, you know, we, there's nothing, you know, you, you're, you're ready and they're, 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 they're not ready for you. So uh, that basically what life's a pitch and then they buy is, is a book that just breaks that down and walks you through that. Yeah. So, Bill, let's point. Where should people go to check out more and learn more about you? Um, I guess the best place, the best two places, are either our website, uh, famousdiscoveries.com, or um, you can go to LinkedIn. Uh, look up, look me up there on LinkedIn. There's a fair amount on LinkedIn. I publish articles there periodically, um, and yeah. uh, those are my two. Those are my yeah. two places I publish. Yeah. Any uh, parting words for everyone? For anyone? what's the, the last thing uh, we should leave them with? Um, pick a topic. Well, what, you, inspirationally or uh, professionally well, or what are you, what would you yeah, like? Yeah, um, I guess sale, with sales. Like, you know, everyone wants to improve their sales, maybe their sales message or their sales in general. What would you, uh, what advice would you give them? Well, I would tell people to stop selling. Start selling and start telling. The, the things that... Um, the things that people buy from today are are products that actually deliver their promise to their customer. So, if a product delivers a promise to a customer, someone else will tell it will, will sell for you. So, all you have to do is tell people and prove it to them. Stop selling. Nice. Thank you, Bill. I really appreciate it, and uh, it's been fantastic. All right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Bye bye. <laughs>